So uh, yeah, hi everyone. I, I'll, I'll talk about positive non-commutative rational functions. So that's um, based on joint work uh, with Igor Klepp, Spila Spinko, and James Pesco in, 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 in several papers. And of course, uh, building on several um, previous results in this non-commutative direction. So there's going to be more, more, more people staring, uh, starting in, in this talk. Um, the plan for the talk, we're going to start with a little bit of a commutative introduction. As Gordon said, I mean, this, um, this motivation um, goes back well into the prehistory, uh, uh, all the way to Hilbert's prob Hilbert problems. Um, so that's going to be a commutative intro. Then we're going to uh, motivate uh, why we care that when we study matrix inequalities. And uh, then we're going to consider what happens with non-commutative polynomials, non-commutative rational functions, um, and their positivity on matrices in, in, in two settings, either on matrices of a fixed size, of a fixed dimension, or what happens when we talk about positivity on matrices of all possible sizes. Um, as I said, the commutative idea, pretty old. Um, let for, uh, for a few slides, let X be a tuple of commuting variables. And I'm going to say that a polynomial, multivariate polynomial in these variables with real coefficients is positive if all the values are non-negative whenever I plug in tuple of real numbers. Um, now, there are some obvious examples of such polynomials. Namely, if I take sums of squares of polynomials, um, this kind of polynomials are obviously positive. And um, well, my one can ask, well, is that all there is? And um, well, yes, if you're in one variable, that's true. And that goes way back to Gauss, 18 something something. So um, if a univariate polynomial is positive, if and only if it's a sum of squares, actually of two squares. Um, however, this fails as soon as you have two variables or more. So this was already known to Hilbert uh, just before 1900, although somehow for the concrete polynomial, uh, we had to wait a little bit longer. So Motskin gave the concrete the first concrete polynomial, so this polynomial of degree six. Um, you can check that it's positive, um, but you cannot write it as a sum of squares of polynomials. Um, and this question, so this interplay between positivity and sums of squares, um, like uh, got major attention uh, uh, among Hilbert's problems. So Hilbert's 17 problem, that's one of those problems that actually uh, got solved into in, in, in the positive direction. So Hilbert asked, well, okay, if I have a positive polynomial, um, okay, it's not necessarily a sum of square of polynomials, but is it a sum of square? squares of rational functions. And um, a little less than 30 years later, the answer um, was yes by Artin. So Artin proved that the answer is really yes. So um, if you look at this polynomial that we saw before, Motskin's polynomial, you can write it as a sum of, you can write it like that. And from here you see that, yeah, it's a, it's a sum of squares of rational functions. Later on, there were even uh, some refinements of Artin's theorem. Uh, for example, you can bound how many terms do you need in, in this sum of squares representation. And um, if your polynomial is strictly positive um, and you know the, the, the bound by which is bounded, then you can even uh, say something about denominators. And um, so this interplay between geometry on one side, so positivity in algebra on the other side, sums of squares, um, has been a big, probably the the main, well, the, the 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 fundamental milestone for what we nowadays call real algebraic geometry. So real algebraic geometry, in, in general, it studies positivity. It studies semi-algebraic sets. So these are sets given by polynomial inequalities. Positivity on such sets, geometry of such set, such sets, and so on. Um, so. The Hilbert 17 problem, of course, to algebraize, it has a, it has a great appeal. Um, but in general, these sums of squares representations also have um, great uh, applicative value. Um, 
concretely in polynomial optimization. Um, so later on, this kind of sums of square certificate for positivity were also given, for example, not just for uh, global positivity like Hilbert 17 problem, but also for positivity on compacts in the algebraic set. So uh, the main two results are by Schmutgen, Schmutgen and Putinart. And um, these results were then used for, for, uh, for, for getting an algorithm for polynomial optimization by Lasser. And let me just give you a, 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 li a little example um, how this looks like, just because I'll, I'll, I'll refer to this later on. So for example, let's say that I, want, that I have a polynomial. I want to, uh, I want to maximize it over, uh, over a ball. So this D here, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ball, right? Um, so let's say that I want to maximize that. And um, well, that's the same as um, finding the, the, the smallest mu such that mu minus p is non-negative, is positive on d. Now, I didn't exactly state what's Putiner's results, but Putiner's results is, is crucial to say that, well, saying that mu minus p is, is, is positive, well, because I was looking for the smallest mu, that's then the same as lo looking for the smallest mu such that mu minus p is, it, it can be written as a sum of squares plus one minus x1 squared minus so on minus xd squared times s1, where s1 is again a sum of squares. So think of it like that. So if I, if I can write mu minus p in such a way, that means that mu minus p is non-negative on d because both of the terms are non-negative on d, right? So um, we, 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 we now translated this um, like maxim well, maximization over D into trying to write mu minus P in terms of sums of squares. Um, and then we go a little bit further. I say, well, I, okay, I'm gonna replace that mu with mu L where um, I'm kind of gonna be minimizing the same thing. It's just that now I'm gonna um, impose some bounds on the degrees of these um, sums of squares that appear in here, right? So let's say that I, I bound the degrees by L and I call that mu L, then um, this maximum of the polynomial over, 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 the, over the, the, the ball is the same as the limit when L goes to infinity of mu L. Um, so why is that great to, to, to bound the degrees? Well, it's um, now when you're looking at that, it's kind of a, um, it's uh, now that I bounded the degree, um, you can restate this fine. So computing mu L, so solving this minimization thing, you can, you can compute that with a semi-definite program. Um, so what's a semi-definite program? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a black box that you open a MATLAB, you throw this in MATLAB and you can actually compute it. Okay. So um, in some sense, the point is that detecting sums of squares, the composition, sums of squares, representations can be done with semi-definite program. So in some sense, it's easy, or at least there are efficient algorithms for doing that. Okay, so these ideas of certifying positivity with sums of squares and also then applying this to optimization. Today, I wanna to talk about how to apply these ideas, relatively old ideas from commutative algebra from, um, to, 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 to non-commutative things, namely to, to polynomial and rational inequalities in matrix variables. So matrices don't commute, so here, here we get our non-commutativity. And um, why, I mean, why, why would you wanna care about polynomial rational inequalities, multivariable in matrix variables, well, they, they naturally appear in several areas. For example, in, in control theory, in matrix analysis, um, also in quantum information theory, we had um, a few talks already about uh, quantum information today by Vern, um, um, before we, um, the, the previous day by, by Magdalena, um, about uh, more maybe in direction of operator algebras. Um, and even some, some commutative optimization problems that are really hard, you can relax them, make them matricial problems, and then they are kind of uh, easier to solve. So there's, there, there, there are several reasons why anyone should care about polynomial and rational inequalities. And for example, if you, if you start opening this um, textbooks from, from control theory and matrix analysis, you can make a collage of, of, of various rational inequalities that 
um, that, that one cares about. Um, so let me introduce the, 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 the players um, for, for today's talk. Um, so what exactly do I mean by non-commutative polynomials, non-commutative rational functions? So throughout the rest of the talk, let x now denote a tuple of freely non-commuting variables. So I just mean that x1 to xd are variables without any relations between them. And x transpose should be their formal adjoints. And our free algebra of non-commutative polynomials as a set, this is just a set of linear combinations of words in, 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 in x and x transpose. So something like that. Um, there's a natural way how to add expressions like that, natural way how to multiply them. There's also involution, so that's a free algebra with involution. And what's the involution? Well, the involution is, is, is given, in, so involution um, switches xj and xj transpose, and because it's involution, it reverses the order of multiplication. So here we have a little example. Now, um, since I want to talk about matrix inequalities, we want to evaluate non-commutative polynomials on tuples of matrices. So for example, if I have a pair of matrices X, so X1, X2, and I take this polynomial, well, let's just substitute X1 with the first matrix, X2 with the second matrix. Um, wherever I see this formal adjoint, I use the matrix transpose. Wherever I see a scalar, I just replace it with a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. And um, the way how this involution was defined on the free algebra, we see that, well, if I have a polynomial that stays preserved under the involution, then all its values are going to be symmetric matrices. These are non-commutative polynomials. Um, and then non-commutative rational functions are a little bit more subtle objects. So their constructions goes back to Amitsur and Kohn in 60s and 70s. Um, we say, so, so it turns out that free algebra is an algebraic object. It admits the universal, a universal skew field of fractions. I'm putting fractions here in quotation marks because, well, we're non-commutative. We don't really have fractions. But uh, intuitively, you can imagine what, what this should be, right? It should be something like, well, I start with uh, non-commutative polynomials. I start adding the inverses and, and maybe nesting stuff and combining and so on. So we get expressions of this form. This is what I'm going to call a formal rational expression. And I'm going to say, well, the domain of the expression, well, these are just all the tuples uh, of matrices, x of all possible sizes. Uh, such that this expression makes sense when I evaluate it at this tuple. So for example, for this first expression, I see that, for example, the, the first matrix X1, it needs to be invertible if I want to make sense of that. And probably a little bit more needs to be true. Um, now, the problem is, of course, that when you're looking at this formal rational expressions, I mean, I, I, I did this you know, completely formally just started uh, syntactically adding stuff together. It can, of course, happen that some, some expressions uh, behave completely the same when I'm plugging in matrices. Um, or maybe I even define some rational expressions that don't make any sense. So what I do next is I discard expressions that have empty domain. And for the rest, I define that two expressions should be equivalent if they have the same evaluations on the intersection of their domains. It turns out that's an equivalent re equivalence relations, re relation, and uh, non-commutative rational functions are then the equivalence classes of these formal expressions. So here we have one, one example that's not maybe completely obvious, but this expression, the first one, the black one, is equivalent to this blue one. Right? And maybe here we already see a little bit of why, why NC rational functions can be a little bit complicated because sometimes you look at two expressions and it's maybe not completely obvious if they represent the same function or not. Um, what I want to talk about today is positivity. And uh, just to make this precise, I, I, want to, I want to talk about two setups. So one is dimension fixed setup where I want to describe NC rational functions whose evaluations are positive semi-definite for all n tuples of n times n matrices in their domain 
where n is fixed. And then the second setting that I want to talk about is um, when, when, I, when I relax the, the, the restriction on the dimension and I, just, um, uh, and I just require for the function to be positive semi-definite for all x is in its domain. Okay? So the first, the first uh, function, I would call it n positive. So positive on n times n matrices. The other one, I'm simply going to call positive. So positive on all matrices. Um, and uh, so how and, and how do I want to describe that? Well, in analogy with, with the commutative setting, I want to describe this using sums of squares. Of course, now I'm in the com in non-commutative setting. Um, square is not really positive. However, a Hermitian square is positive. So expression of the form, let's say here, R1 times R1 transpose, this is something that's always going to be positive, whatever you plug in. OK, so um, maybe maybe just why am I making my life complicated? Why do I want to talk about ANSI rational functions instead of just ANSI polynomials? Um, so first of all, I mean, um, because and rational functions, you can have this nested inverses because of non-commutativity. It's kind of a clear that rational inequalities do not, well, not, it's not clear, but it's, it's not surprising if I say that rational inequalities don't always reduce to polynomial inequalities. And here we have a first natural source of inequalities, let's say block matrices. If I want to say that block matrix is, let's say, positive definite, I can, I can, I can rewrite that in, in some uh, positivity of, of rational functions. But I can't do that in terms of polynomials only. And finally, something that we're going to see a little bit later is that when you start considering non-commutative polynomials that satisfy certain positivity conditions, let's say positive polynomials, or I know convex polynomials, so that would be a positivity condition on second derivative, derivative and so on, it turns out that this non-commutative positivity conditions are rather strong. So these classes of such polynomials are, are, are a bit more exclusive than their commutative counterparts. Uh, so to get a really rich theory, um, you kind of want to include non-commutative rational functions. Um, just few 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 words about uh, what are the tools when I deal with non-commutative rational functions. So um, the first one comes uh, are so-called realizations coming from control theory and automata theory. Um, the point is that whenever I have a ANSI rational function, I can always represent it like that. So as some row vector times inverse of an affine matrix times a column vector. So here I have a little example. So this rational function, you can represent it like that. What do I mean represented? So this equation holds in the within the free skew field of ANSI rational functions. Um, the benefit of representing functions like that is that you, you, you're kind of a, you, you're taking all this nasty stuff about expressions and what not nested inverses, and you hide them into this linear matrix. Right? So you're kind of a linearizing problem, and that turns out to be a very helpful thing. Um, and there's there, this is a rich theory about uh, realization. So we know that the minimal realization is essentially unique. There are algorithms how to determine it. Um, also, this 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 um, this linear matrix, this affine matrix here, tells you a lot about the domain of the function and so on. So that's one tool. The other tool um, comes from a completely different direction. That's invariant theory. Um, so if I have an ANSI rational function, I take a tuple of matrices and I take, a, take an orthogonal matrix, I can see that only well, doesn't matter if I first conjugate the tuple and then apply R to it, or if I first plug X into R and then conjugate the result. Right? So in other words, um, rational functions uh, give me equivariant maps for, for the orthogonal action. So this is example. Uh, again, a little example here. And uh, the funny thing that turns out is that well, whenever I have a, a equivariant rational map from tuples of matrices to matrices, it's always given by an ANSI rational function. Okay. These are kind of our main tools that we deal with. And now let me finally really go to the positivity and tell you a few results. So first, positivity 
um, of answer rational functions for a fixed dimension. Um, let's start with a conjecture by Prochacy and Schacher. Um, well, they conjecture the following. So let's fix size of matrices M, then a rational function, so this, they, they conjecture that a rational function is M positive, if and only if it agrees with the sum of, squ uh, sum of Hermitian squares of rational functions on N times N matrices. So this sounds pretty reasonable, right? Because if M is equal to one, if I just deal with, scalar, uh, with scalars here, um, then this is just Hilbert 17 problem, right? Um, so yes, this conjecture is true for n equal one because that's uh, that's Artin solution of Hilbert 17 problem. It's also true for n equals two. However, it's false for n equals three. Um, nevertheless, not everything's lost. So so what did Prochacy and Schacher actually proved was the following. So um, a rational function is n positive if and only if you can write it as a sum of, 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 of Hermitian squares and traces of Hermitian squares. So if you can you can you can represent it on n times n matrices with an expression of this form. Right? So one direction should be obvious, right? I mean, if R agrees with an expression of this form, then well, it's going to be and positive because traces because squares are positive and traces of squares are positive. Um, so comparing the conjecture and the theorem, we see that basically what's what's the question? The question is if you can replace traces of Hermitian squares with sums of Hermitian squares. So that that's kind of a the basic question um, in, in 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 answering Prochacy Schacher conjecture. Uh, as I said, n equals one is easy. N equals two, it turns out that uh, for two times two matrices, you can always express trace of x times x transpose as a Hermitian square plus a Hermitian square. Um, on the other hand, as soon as any, uh, uh, when n is equal to three, you cannot do that. So while trace of x times x transpose agrees with some non-commutative rational function on three times three matrices, it does not agree with the sums of square of Hermitian squares of n rational functions. Um, so that's n equal three, n equals four, that's still open at the moment. Um, because I talked about at the beginning about, about optimization, let me just say that whenever, whenever you have kind of a, um, whenever you're checking positivity on n times n matrices with, with, a, with some, um, on a some constraint set, so we have some compact con constraint set, um, everything plays nicely and you don't need traces of squares. So let me just make here a little, um, I'm, I'm just gonna specialize here to a bold situation like, like in the introduction. So um, if I have a, let's say polynomial, NC polynomial, that's non-negative on so-called matrix ball, so tuples of matrices satisfying this matrix inequality, um, well, this happens if and only if for every epsilon you can you can rewrite p plus epsilon as something like that. So this is a precise analog of the famous Putiner's positive Schellenzatz for the case n equals one. Again, Putiner's positive—I mean, this theorem and Putiner's positive Schellenzatz, they, they they hold more generally for for um, compact sets with Archimedean representation. But here I'm just doing one one little um, example. And um, so that's that's basically what we can say about N positivity, about positivity on matrices of, of fixed size. Um, now let me go to the other spectrum. So now, now let's talk about uh, how can we describe positivity in all dimensions. And um, here the results are somewhat cleaner. So. Um, this goes back to, to, to a seminal theorem by uh, independently proven by Helton and McAuliffe, showing that a non-commutative polynomial is positive if and only if you can write it as a sum of Hermitian squares of polynomials. So the point is, you don't need you don't need rational functions if you if you want to talk about non positivity of non-commutative polynomials. 
And even more, because you can represent polynomials as a sum of squares of polynomials, you automatically get degrees, degree bounds on, on these terms. And uh, after you get that, you also automatically get the, 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 the bound on L, on how many summons do you need here. So this theorem was, 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 a, was a big breakthrough in this um, kind of a, this, this type of study of dimension independent matrix inequalities. And it's, it's a basis for what we nowadays call free real algebraic geometry, uh, which studies positivity on free semi-algebraic sets. This adjective free here refers to the fact that my, my, my polynomials come from a free algebra, and also that I'm, I'm, I'm asking in the, um, dimension free questions. So free semi-algebraic sets are sets uh, um, in, 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 in tuples of all matrices that are given by non-commutative polynomial inequalities. Um, this theorem already tells me that, I mean, in the NC setting, things are in this dimension free um, setting, things are a little bit more restrictive than in the commutative setting, right? Because in particular, I see that Motskin polynomial, which is positive, but not a sum of squares, does not come from some positive NC polynomial, right? Because every positive NC polynomial has a sum of squares representation, right? On the other hand, I can find a positive NC rational function that, that on the further, uh, that on scalars gives me the Motskin polynomial. Um, now we can go further on. We can now, now, now say, well, but what happens for, for, for non-commutative rational functions? Um, and the first step in this direction was done for functions without singularities. So we proved that if I have a rational function without singularities, then it's positive if and only if it can be written as a sum of Hermitian squares of functions without singularities. The important thing is here that even though we deal with NC rational functions, so it's, they are um, much more complicated objects than non-commutative polynomials, we nevertheless get a bound on L and we get a bound on the complexity of the terms. I did not quite specify what this should mean, but somehow we can measure how complicated an NC rational function is. And now what do I mean here without singularities? So for example, this function here doesn't have any singularities in the sense that whichever pair of matrices I plug in, this inverse is always gonna be well-defined. Right? So defined on all tuples of matrices. Maybe this looks like a hard, I mean, this is, an interesting property, but um, you could, there, there's actually an algorithm for checking whether or not a given NC rational function has singularities or not. Um, but pretty re much more recently, we uh, like um, it was possible to to, to push this um, past the singularities issues, and now we get a um, analog of Hilbert 17 problem for the free skew field, namely an NC rational function is positive if and only if you can write it as a sum of Hermitian squares. Still, there's a bound on L, bound on the complexity of the terms. It's a little bit weaker than in the previous case without, um, without singularities. Um, however, you can always even ask for a, for a nice situation where, where all these terms have domain that, it's, that contains the domain of the original function. So what does this theorem tell you? It tells you that well, whenever you have a rational inequality, it basically needs to, it, it needs to arise from sums of squares. So on, the, on, the, on one of the slides in the introduction, when I just gave you a collage of, of, of inequalities, one of them was this one that holds for all positive definite, uh, positive definite matrices A and B of all possible sizes. So why, why is this inequality true? Well, there's several different ways of how to show that. One way to show it is that, um, well, this expression, so the difference of these two things can be written as a sum of squares. Concretely, you can write this expression as a sum of, here should be R1, R1 transpose, um, where, uh, so these two terms come from these two rational functions. Now, this is, this is now positivity on, on all matrices without any constraints. Um, however, we can do a little bit better, which is going to give us um, some more interesting examples. And for the sake of time, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit. Um, 
And let me let me say a few things about linear matrix inequalities. So I'm going to say that the Hermitian monic pencil is an affine matrix over the free algebra that is, well, Hermitian. And uh, monic refers to the fact that the constant term is identity matrix. Then um, looking at the inequality and being positive semi-definite, this is now, this is then called the linear matrix inequality or LMI. And um, the set of all matrix tuples that make M of X positive semi-definite is called a free spectratum. Again, this adjective here, free refers to the fact that I'm looking at all tuples of matrices. Two typical examples. Um, so if I take if I take M to be a direct sum of these two times two matrices, then the corresponding free spectrum is so-called matrix cube. So it's just um, the set of tuples of matrix contractions. Another example that gives me a matrix row ball is by taking this Fermission Monic pencil. And um, on linear matrix inequalities, we can we can get a so-called positive shivers. So on, on this on, on this uh, on, 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 on free spectra, we have a precise sums of square certificate for detecting positivity. Um, that is, if I have a rational function such that uh, wherever m of x is positive semi-definite, then r of x is positive semi-definite. This happens if and only if you can represent r in this way, and this l here should be m. So sum of squares plus kind of a sum of squares with m in between. Um, this theorem builds builds on the um, I mean rests on the on the on the shoulders of giants. So it was for the first it was it was proven in steps first for non-commutative polynomials by Helton, McCulloch, and Clip, then for NC rational functions without singularities in the free spectrator on by, by James, by Pasco. And um, now we can have potentially singularities there. So why do um, so so of course the, the um, it's nice to have this theorem in the sense that okay, it's now general, it, it, it also works for rational functions. It also gives you a little bit more than than, than just a generalization from polynomials for rational functions. For example, it gives us this funny, funny little um, example. So, example of a polynomial that admits a rational positive Schellensatz, but not a polynomial positive Schellensatz. What do I mean by that? And now let me just by by x, let me just denote one variable x one. So, if I take the polynomial x transpose x minus one, it satisfies the following property: so that if I have some NC rational function that then this implication that x transpose x minus identity is positive semi-definite implies r of x is positive semi-definite for all x in the domain of r. This happens if and only if r can be written in this particular way. So this is what I would say that rational that this polynomial admits a rational positive Schellensatz. Now, um, why is that true? Well, this, this inequality x transpose x minus one, that's not an LMI, right? If you think about it, what's, what this in scalar terms, terms mean, well, this is kind of a, the, the inside, the, the outside of a unit disk. However, I can do a rational change of variables, so y equals x inverse, and this inequality becomes one minus y transpose y bigger or equal to to zero, and that's that's given by linear. That can be represented by linear matrix inequality, right? So, in particular, that means that um, we can see that the polynomial x x transpose minus one uh, can be written in this way. So, what does that mean? Well, that means that if I have uh, if a matrix satisfies x transpose x minus identities is positive semi-definite, then also x x transpose minus identities is positive semi-definite. That's not surprising. We all know that from linear algebra. Um, now I'm just giving a very specific proof of this fact in terms of sums of squares. However, you could not get this kind of a sums of represent sums of squares representation in terms of polynomials. So you cannot, you cannot, so, so here I need rational functions. I cannot take polynomials in Ri and Sj, even though xx transpose minus one is a polynomial. 
because if I could, what would happen? Well, then this inequality, this implication, so x trans x x star x minus identity bigger than zero implies x x star minus identity being uh, bigger or equal to zero. And then this would hold not just for matrices, but in general for 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 uh, for for all operators on possibly infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Right? Because if I could have if I would have a representation of this form with polynomials, I could just plug in. Any 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 operator on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, but we know that this implication fails for 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 such operators. For example, if I take the forward shift x, then this implication fails. Okay. Um, finally, what what we can now do now with 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 this um, with, with the fact with this uh, with sums of squared certificates is that. Um, if I, um, I I can I can design uh, we can we can we can set up an optimization procedure using this. Uh, so let's say that I I, I want to know what's the what what what, what is the possible uh, what's the largest possible eigenvalue of R of x where x is in the domain of R and in the free spectrum determined by a Hermitian monic pencil. And um, as in the beginning of the talk, as in the commutative setting, we can use the same strategy um, we 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 um, we translate this into this uh, question about is mu minus r positive semi definite on the free spectrum and um, since we have a positive Stevensatz that uh, that translates into a question wall find the smallest possible mu such that mu minus r has this sums of squares representation now, as I said before, we had uh, in this NC setting, we have bounds on terms of in, in the in the sums of squared certificate. So that means that this um, this optimization problem can be written as a semi-definite program, uh, which means that the same methods, so the methods for solving semi-definite programs can be applied for optimizing eigenvalues of NC rational functions over our free spectrator. Just a little bit of a comparison. So um, non-commutative versus, versus commutative case. So eigenvalue optimization of answer rational function can be now done with a single SDP, right? And that's different from the commutative setting where uh, for a polynomial on a compact semi-algebraic set, not necessarily linear matrix inequality, but any compact one, one, one cannot do that with one SDP, but you need a sequence of SDPs whose solutions will converge to the maximum of R. And uh, so in particular, that also means that just checking whether or not some fun non NC rational function is positive, um, that's it's kind of a easy in the sense that, that that just can be restated as a semi-definite program. So that means that essentially, in theory, any 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 rational quality that you have, you can you could check it with MATLAB. Um, commutatively, that's problematic because uh, unless you know that your function is bounded from below by some positive constant, um, it, this is a bit hard because you don't have um, you don't have bounds on the on the on the on the num on the numerators and denominators. Um, to to wrap up the talk, maybe just a few open questions. As I said, NC rational functions, we like to think of them. In terms of minimal realizations, so um, if I'm talking about positivity, is it also possible to certify positivity in terms of minimal realizations? And um, maybe next question, as I said already before, um, NC rational functions that are positive on four times four matrices, uh, we know that we can write them as sums of squares and their traces. Now the question is, do we really need traces? Um, we also saw that, um, that there's a little bit of a there can be a little bit of a discrepancy between um, operator inequalities and matrix inequalities, and um, maybe a natural question is all well, how far beyond linear matrix inequalities can we go to have matricial positive Stellenzitze for NC rational functions? If I if I if I replace matrices with, with operators, uh, then this is this this is known. You have the best possible positive Schrierensätze by Hilton and McCulloch. 
for polynomials and PASCO for rational functions. And finally, sometimes you don't care about positivity of NC rational functions, so whether or not eigenvalues are positive, but you care about positivity of trace. And that's already an interesting question for polynomials and, and um, related to, um, has close connections with, with Kohn's embedding conjecture and, and quantum information theory. And uh, there's many, there's in a sense, not much known about this characterization if you, if you want to restrict only to matrices. Uh, and maybe a sub question of this is, well, for matrices, uh, for, for NC rational functions, at the moment, we don't even know how to characterize uh, rational functions that, that have zero trace. We I would think that they need to be sums of commutators, but um, that's open at the moment. Um, and now just a summary what to take home and um, thank you for your attention. Right, first I'd, I'd like to thank um, Yurik Balcic for a very illuminating talk relating to um, non-commutative versions of um, Hilbert's 17th problem and so forth. Um, I believe there weren't any questions from the audience, uh, so I, I'd like to raise one, um, namely about the, the computation of um, some of these quantities, such as sums of squares. I mean, the, there was a, a mention of um, looking for solutions on MATLAB, but how, how, in how many cases um, have you considered effective computation of, of these questions. So for, um, for, for, for polynomials, that, that's been proven quite efficient. So, so then there are, there are um, already packages written in, in, in MATLAB, maybe also now already in Mathematica, um, that, that really apply this method for methods for optimizing ANSI polynomials. Um, for NC rational functions, I did have some uh, some little implementation for for, um, for, 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 for function for NC rational functions, but it is true that the problematic thing is that um, the bounds on how big the SDPs need to be um, are, are are much bigger for NC rational functions than for polynomials. So um, it would be a question of how to how to push those bounds down. Um, but at least for polynomials, that works pretty well using this kind of certificates for optimizing. Right. Thank you. So I'd therefore like to thank um, Yurik Polchich for such an illuminating talk on this emerging topic. Thank you.